Hello, and welcome to the C19 Weekly. I'm your host, Nicholas Tatnetti, professor in the Department of Biomedical Informatics at Columbia University. Each week, we go through some of the latest and most exciting research papers on COVID-19, SARS-CoV-2, with a special focus on those that are data science or informatics oriented. I want to create a snapshot of what's exciting right now, not do a comprehensive re review of all of the hundreds of articles that are coming out all the time. This week, we're going to look at a study that dove into this question about why some people are maybe more susceptible to others, looking at the expression of ACE2 and differences across different populations. We're looking at antibody response to SARS-CoV-2 and with a special focus on vaccines and vaccine development. And a couple of shout outs at the end. So first, looking at clinical evaluation of ACE2 concentrations. Circulating plasma concentrations of angiotensin converting enzyme 2 in men and women with heart failure and effects of renin angiotensin aldosterone inhibitors. Sama et al., European Heart Journal, May 10th, 2020. The goal of this study was to evaluate the effect of clinical covariates and drug exposures on the concentration of ACE2. They measured ACE2 in the blood and they performed univariate and multivariate analyses and regressions to identify which clinical covariates or factors might be predictive or correlated with ACE2 concentration. They found that being male, uh, that blood pressure, COPD, and some comor comorbidities like COPD, atrial fibrillation, and heart failure severity were all associated with ACE2. They reuse existing studies, so there's no SARS-CoV-2 patients in this data set. They were really just looking at, they had a data set, it had ACE2 measured in it, and it had a bunch of clinical covariates. So they wanted to evaluate if any of those were important for ACE2, since we know that enzyme, uh, that molecule itself, that protein itself, is so important for infection. So it's a good use of existing data, but I would say far from conclusive. I think they were primarily focused on whether or not trying to disprove this hypothesis that some drugs like ACE inhibitors um, and renin angiotensin aldosterone inhibitors, ARBs, um, are, are causing ACE2 to increase and so making people more susceptible. It would be kind of a, a pretty staggering finding and it has been floated around but without a ton of evidence. So they were really interested, I think, in trying to disprove that. I don't know if they actually provide enough data to totally disprove that hypothesis, um, but it is one piece of evidence. We'll dive in a little bit. I'll disclose, I'm a co-author on a different study that's available by preprint that also is looking into a similar issue. And I'll let you read through it and decide for yourself. So here's that analysis that they did broken down by patients and the level of ACE2 that they had. They split them into quartiles and they looked at different clinical covariates. They found some were associated with these quartiles. As you can see, um, left ventricular ejection fraction, I highlighted as being one of them. This is an important, um, they found that this was different, even though I don't really see why they found it was different. So this was the first thing that I didn't really like about this study. Um, while uh, if you have a test that finds differences where all of your medians are the same, it makes me a little suspicious of that test, especially when the p-values are, are so significant in this case. But you can see there's other things that make more sense. They have clear differences, lower blood pressure, for example, associated with higher ACE2 levels. Um, and and you can see some other ones there, heart rate, that's expected, um, and the severity of the disease, the heart failure. They looked at specific um, uh, exposure conditions. These are the drug exposures, these ACEs and ARBs that we've been talking about, and whether or not they were associated in differing levels of ACE2. What they found was that it was really inconsistent across their two data sets. They didn't find any really consistent results except um, that exposure to this one type of drug, MRAs, uh, is associated with increased ACE2. This probably could be better explained by some of their other clinical covariates though, so they don't highlight it as one of their central findings. This is the multivariate analysis, probably the most rigorous analysis in this paper, and it identifies many different factors that are significantly associated in the multivariate regression, meaning once they account for all of the other variables, with the level of ACE2. They really only mention sex as being significant uh, covariate with ACE2, and they focus on the fact that they did not find that the drug exposures were significant covariates with ACE2. Again, I think they're really focused on trying to disprove that rather than identify clinical covariates. 
The other important caveat with this study is that it's only done in a, in a group of heart failure patients. So it is a very biased cohort, and so it might not generalize to other populations. All right, let's dive into the next part. Antibody response to SARS-CoV-2. Antibody response to SARS-CoV-2 in patients with COVID-19. Long et al., Nature Medicine, published on April 20th, 2020. The goal of this study was to evaluate how many people develop antibodies after they are infected with the virus. They used serological tests that we've been talking about for quite a few weeks, and evaluated this in 285 patients within 19 days of infection. They found that all of the patients that they studied tested positive for antibodies, both types that they tested for, and that antibody levels actually plateaued after six days. Uh, so the conclusion here is that nearly everyone develops antibodies and that serological tests will be very valuable, especially as we get more information about their false positive rates and their false negative rates going forward at determining who was infected with SARS-CoV-2. These are the data they present. So we see that antibody levels increase post-infection and plateauing again after that six, seven day window. And they found that patients with severe disease had greater antibodies um, than patients without severe disease in, in most of the comparisons that they conducted. They also found that IgM could show up first with one type of antibody or the other type of antibody could also, that they tested could also show up first. And so this was different based on patient to patient. Some patients had them both increase at the same time. There's probably uh, patient to patient differences or variability in the immune response that could explain this basically just showing that you probably need to test for both to have a, a good sound evaluation. Development of vaccine candidates. So this was recently published in Science on May 6, 2020, development of an inactivated vaccine candidate for SARS-CoV-2, Gao et al. The goal here, develop a vaccine, very simply. The method was to pilot the development of a purified, inactivated SARS-CoV-2 vaccine. Now, an, an activated vaccine is one that doesn't pose any danger for reinfection, like an attenuated vaccine would, but it is often doesn't elicit the same magnitude of immune response, and so it doesn't confer as much immunity, but it can be quite a bit safer. They found that treatment with this inactivated vaccine elicited immune response that can neutralize 10 different representative strains of SARS-CoV-2 that they collected from around the world. And that basically the conclusion is that standard vaccine development is showing great promise, exactly what we'd like to see preclinically, and we'd like to see this move forward into the clinical phases, of course. These are the 10 representative strains that they collected from around the world. This was a study that was conducted in China. Uh, and it, this is a, a representation, a figure of the vaccine production process. So from gathering the vaccine, inactivating it, and purifying it, and then turning that into the vaccine product. This is a plot that shows the antibody response or the immune system response when treated with the vaccine versus a placebo and with infection. So what you can see here in the blue and red are the antibody, are the um, people who are vaccinated not people, the animals that were vaccinated and their immune response to that vaccination. And in green and in gray are shown the placebos and a sham treatment, basically a fake, a fake vaccine treatment. And you can see that their antibodies in those animals increase after infection as we'd expect. And so this data is pretty strong showing that the vaccine is working in these animals. This is really the best figure from this paper. This is in non-human primates. So they looked at the viral load in non-human primates treated with this vaccine. And what they found is in the, in the non-human primates treated with the vaccine, they found little to no viral RNA, whereas they found quite a bit, of course, in the placebos and in the sham, the fake vaccine treatment. And I showed this study to a colleague and virologist friend of mine, and this is what he said about it. He said, inactivated vaccines can be especially useful for the elderly and immunosuppressed because they're safer. And while they uh, induce protected antibody responses, they usually require boosters. So that means that people will have to come back and get more, leading the door open for noncompliance. They also said, he also said that they're tried and tested though, and he would get one if given the opportunity. So I think that's a pretty strong statement there. Special feature on vaccines. There's a couple of 
of research articles, journalistic articles that came out of looking at the, uh, the state of vaccine development. And what I'm going to highlight right now is published in Bloomberg News as a look at the most promising candidates for a COVID-19 vaccine by these four authors. The goal here was to review the 100 approximately efforts around the world to develop a vaccine. They use reporting techniques and journalistic techniques as their method. The result is that they found that seven vaccines are in a late stage clinical trials. One is in early stage clinical trials phase one, and there are many that are in the preclinical phase. My conclusion from reading this very pithy and short article is that the race is really on to develop this vaccine with AstraZeneca and Oxford, that collaboration leading the way, followed by this other collaboration, BioNTech and Pfizer, coming up from behind. In that case, actually saying that that vaccine could be approved for emergency use by the end of the year. That seems pretty optimistic, but we will see. That's what they're pushing for. They have a pretty nice visualization of all of the uh, studies or when, where, which phase they're in. And you can see them here, the seven studies that are in phase one or phase two clinical trials, more late stage trials are highlighted on the right. I would have liked a little bit more from this article, to be honest. I thought it was going to be a much more data-driven uh, article, and that's why I was going to include it, and I was really excited about reading it. it. Ended up being very pithy, really short, but I still like the visualization, visualization and the call out to the study so that you can find out more. I want to do a couple of shout outs, starting with this really spectacular paper looking at how scientists have gathered around the world really uh, rolled up their sleeves and started working on this problem, no matter what their field of science might be. And so it also comes with this really beautiful illustration. This was a paper published in Cell, May 11th, Biomedical Research Goes Viral, Dangers and Opportunities. I think it's worth a read. It's very quick and very uh, digestible for everybody. Another shout out I want to make is this really in-depth review of the immunology of COVID-19. If you're interested in this type of research or applying it, this is a must read so you understand the data that you're working with, the problem that you're working on, and how you might be able to make an impact. So highly recommend reading through this study as well. Of course, there's always links to further reading on the YouTube page. Check that out. Shout outs for studies that we didn't mention and a list of ongoing projects you can volunteer. Remember to subscribe and get video updates as we post them. Thank you all for your time and I will see you next week.